George Kovacs here. This is my bougie rant. Let's be clear up front that the bougie is not a heat-seeking missile you just place in the mouth and all of a sudden it finds the airways. It's about the bougie being an adjunct, bougie being an adjunct to optimize laryngoscopy and intubation. There's a lot of interest uh, recently over the past couple of years um, in using the bougie routinely um, for all airways in the ED setting. And, and that relates in part to the study by Brian Driver and his uh, group you know, published in JAMA, where they had a high first pass success rate, 98% when the bougie was used routinely compared to a, a lower first pass success rate when a stylated endotracheal tube was used. And a lot of people came out of this saying, this and we should all you know, use the bougie routinely and that's going to that's gonna bring magic. But I think one of the big messages from this paper is that it wasn't necessarily just the bougie. It was about this being an airway bundle. This was a group of people that was extraordinarily experienced in, in airway management and in bougie use. They were routinely using a, a Macintosh video laryngoscope and, and doing an RSI in these patients. It was part of this bundle that provided this high first pass success rate, and it wasn't all about the uh, bougie. So when to use the bougie? This is a slide from 1999 from uh, our AIM program. And the, the most common scenario that people would talk about would be with a grade three view. And with a grade three view, which is an epiglottis only view, you're taking advantage of that, that coup de tip, that 30 degree anterior coup de tip of the bougie that you're tucking under the epiglottis and hopefully entering the airway. Then we're realizing that really it has value with the grade two views for the simple matter is that an endotracheal tube is, is bigger and sometimes that obstructs your view and you don't watch it go in as easily as you would with a bougie that you can watch enter uh, through the cords. And so why not use it in grade one views so that you are skilled in using this uh, device um, in, in other situations that are more difficult. Grade four views should be very rare and there is no role for using a bougie in grade four views. There's nothing gum, elastic, or bougie about the bougie. Uh, some prefer to call it a tracheal tube introducer. I think that we're entrenched with the term bougie, and uh, most of us are comfortable with that. We'll continue to uh, use that as a, uh, as a term. Let's recognize what it is, though. For the most part, most, most bougies are straight in a package with that anterior 30-degree coup de tip. But there are variability between bougies. Some are not malleable, some that you cannot bend, some will not retain their bend or retain that memory. And what you're seeing up here on the right-hand side is, is what we call memory. In other words, if you were to bend the bougie, it will stay in that bent position for a certain period of time before it straightens out. So you have to know and understand the materials um, and the uh, way that your bougie functions so that you can properly uh, use it in, in the clinical settings that, that are required. I'm going to focus in on video laryngoscopy and, and using uh, the bougie, and, and more particularly, I'm going to talk about Macintosh uh, video laryngoscopy. On our website, uh, we do have uh, videos for optimized uh, Macintosh video laryngoscopy and optimized hyperangulated video laryngoscopy. The focus here is going to be MacVL and the use of the bougie. Rich Levitin and I uh, wrote an editorial uh, a, a couple of years ago, and it was about um, moving away from all the device stuff and, and concentrating on optimizing uh, laryngoscopy and intubation. And um, we framed the term uh, EVLI, um, epiglottoscopy, voleculoscopy, laryngoscopy, and intubation, which is part of optimizing. Um, that process so that your bougie and other ad adjuncts will be helpful. It was Rich Levitin's term to use epiglottoscopy. It means don't just go in looking for the glottis, go in looking for, you know, the flag that tells you where the hole is, right? So um, look for the epiglottis and then you'll be able to find the glottic inlet um, relative to where, where the epiglottis lives. Now, voleculoscopy is a term we coined and, and it's, well, it didn't used to be something that we were talking about, you were seeing. It was more of an anatomical appreciation. But now with video laryngoscopy, you can actually see it. And what you're seeing on the left-hand side 
you're seeing what's called a glossal epiglottic fold. And at the base of the vollecula, that's where your blade tip wants to be. And if I can see that reflection at the base of the vollecula of the glossal epiglottic fold, that means my blade tip isn't properly positioned. And I can lift all I want here. All the pressure I want is not going to move things out of the way. Whereas if I just drop it down a couple millimeters, all of a sudden I'm able to lift that epiglottis out of the way. So that's what voleculoscopy um, refers to is, is a good placement of your blade tip within the volecula. Now for Macintosh uh, laryngoscopy, it's sort of pretty simple is that uh, using this is a modified, uh, the Cook modified Cormac Lehane scoring system from grade one to grade four. In general, the more you see, the better it is. Um, and uh, the less you see, the better it is. So grade four of you, you can't see anything. There's nothing that you can identify as bad. Grade one, you can see everything and it's all good. And with Macintosh laryngoscopy, it tends to correlate with intubation. So if you've got a good view, a grade one view, tends to be easier. If you've got a grade four view, it is often impossible to intubate them with a, this, uh, with a laryngoscope. I got to start off with the bad. Um, the, the most common reason, I think, for, for uh, us in, in emergency medicine um, and perhaps other settings to see a grade four, it's not a true anatomical grade four. It's the fact that you're adrenalized and, and your blade tip, you didn't do epiglottoscopy, your blade tip is actually in the esophagus. You're doing esophagoscopy. And, and uh, that's what's going on here. The best thing to do, I think, is pull back and you might see something different. But if, if this is all you're seeing, my cynical approach is it's the only tube that should go in there is an orogastric tube. If it's a true anatomical grade four view, um, these will be impossible to uh, intubate using uh, conventional equipment. So with grade three views, they're broken up really into a 3A and a 3B view. And the question is, is it true or you? Again, is that the truly an anatomical um, grade three or uh, 3A or 3B? Or is it because you're not doing appropriate voleculoscopy? Are you pushing the epiglottis posteriorly to create that 3B view? So yeah, you, again, you have to play with your, your, your blade tip and ensure that it is a true view in this scenario. Because what the problem is, is with a 3A view, or sorry, with a 3B view, you will not be able to manage that in, in most circumstances with a bougie that's out of the package. Whereas a 3A view, that's what, um, you know, again, classically was used. Um, with the Gouda tip to tuck it under the epiglottis and you'll be successful. Now for grade two views, they're further broken down in 2A and 2B. 2B just being posterior cartilages, intraretinoid notch, and then the 2A being some portion of the cords. And the question again should be, is this true view um, or is it you? In other words, are you are you lifting too early? Are you not doing appropriate voleculoscopy? But assuming it is, um, is it appropriate to use a, a bougie in this situation? A lot of people say, well, I can manage. There's no problem managing this if I can see the posterior cartilages or the uh, part of the cords. But if you look back at the driver study, this was really the major finding of this study. Grade ones, it didn't really make a difference. Grade threes, yes, it did, but there weren't that many grade threes. It was really the grade twos, because that was the bulk of their airways, that it made a big difference in using the bougie. And for the simple fact is, as I mentioned earlier, when the tube approaches the glottic inlet, it can block your view, as opposed to what you see below, where you can watch the bougie go in. We ultimately talk about three things to do with two hands on first attempt. Right, so you, this is your difficult airway drill with Macintosh laryngoscopy. It begins with after sniffing position, doing an additional head lift, and then putting in towels. That'll often again improve your laryngoscopy. Right, you can improve your laryngoscopy again by reaching around yourself and doing ELM if that works. And if, and then again, next thing to do is move in and, and use a bougie that's ready for you to uh, to grab a hold and place. Right, so three things to do with two hands on first attempt. Do it all in less than thirty seconds. Thirty seconds, and that should be a difficult airway drill. So back to when to bougie. You know, uh, you can argue: Are you going to use it with a grade one view? If you want to do it from a practice point of view, definitely think that there's a role for using it in grade two views. For three A views, there's a role. 
I question whether this value of using it with 3B view and there's no role in using it in a grade four. So that's bougie as an adjunct for optimized laryngoscopy and intubation. Let's move on to some bougie mechanics. Holding my bougie, I like a naked bougie. In other words, I don't like a tube over my bougie as I use it. That's just my preference. Um, I hold it proximal to the middle of the bougie so I don't ultimately have to let go. There's a lot of people who have a lot of experience with using what's either the D grip or the, the Kiwi grip so they can use it uh, solo. It's a preloaded um, bougie and it is cool to use, but there are some limitations in, um, in uh, performing laryngoscopy and intubation with a preloaded bougie, and you just should be aware of those and have a video on our, on our YouTube channel that you can uh, refer back to. You want to keep your tip anterior. You want to keep your, anterior, your tip anterior with the hope that you're going to feel tracheal clicks. And just a reminder, this is what it looks like when you do it on a, this is a cadaver and we're watching the bougie go down and that, that, that tactile sensation of it bumping along, you're going to feel. And remember that the bougie doesn't stop at the carina, like some people have, have mentioned. The bougie goes into the right main stem and goes into a second generation bronchus. So if you go to hold up, that's where that's where it's going to happen. The question is, is when your psychological shock index is high, in other words, your heart rate is greater than your patient's heart rate, your PSI is greater than one. Are you going to be able to feel that subtle tactile uh, uh, feedback of uh, tracheal clicks? And I think that's up for uh, for debate. Avoiding tube and difficult tube delivery. You want to continue laryngoscopy. You want to rotate the uh, your your tube over the bougie quarter turn to the left or counterclockwise as it passes or before it passes through the cords. And you want to or consider using a an alternative tube. You want to continue laryngoscopy because if you don't displace tissues, the the, the tube and the bougie are just going to fold in the in the posterior pharynx, right? You don't want that. You need to displace the tissues so you can soldier that that tube over that bougie into place. If you're running into problems at the uh, at the glottic inlet, it's because the leading edge of the bevel is hitting right-sided structures. So what you want to do is pull it back and rotate left quarter turn counterclockwise, and then and then sink it. An alternative way, which is the preferred way that we teach now, is don't wait for that to happen. Don't wait for a cue that you've got to respond that way. Just routinely every time you place it. Your tube over your bougie preemptively do that quarter turn to the left. That will take the bevel away from the right side of the structures and you'll be able to sink it no problem. You could use an alternative tube such as this Parker Flex Step tube. Um, I'm not going to talk about that in, in detail, but the bevel tip is, is anterior, so it's not going to get caught up on right and left. I certainly use this uh, in, in difficult scenarios, whenever I'm doing a flexible endoscopic intubation, for sure, and sometimes with a bougie. Let's go back and talk about Macintosh laryngoscopy because we think that they're all the same. All of these devices on Google here, the ones that have the blue check mark, are labeled as Macintosh laryngoscopes, and they're not all Macintosh laryngoscopes from a shape point of view, from a camera position point of view. Some are Mac, some are Mac Plus blades. And it's important to appreciate the fact that there are differences out there. Our initial COVID RSI protocol was routinely you know, doing your RSI and you're going to do MacVL plus uh, uh, Bougie. And then we backed off from that. A lot of people were having some problems with this. And at the end of the day, I think it was the right thing is to do what you are most skilled in doing. Um, so you can do MacVL plus or minus Bougie, but if you're skilled in using hyperangulated video uh, laryngoscope, then go ahead and use that as a first attempt approach. The assumption is, though, when you use a MacVL device, is that the the view that you would have in the mouth, right, is the same as the view that you're going to have on the screen, and that's not always the case. It really depends on the device that you use. The study that we did, we were looking at the CMAC and we were looking at the Glidescope Mac blade. We were comparing what you saw in the mouth versus what you saw in the screen. Now, we, we concluded there was no clinically significant difference, but I'm questioning that now in, in, in retrospect. Certainly with the Mac, with the CMAC, there, there, there wasn't any difference. In other words, when you looked in the mouth, 
it was the same as what you saw on the on the screen. Whereas with the GlideScope Mac blade, there was anywhere from a two to eleven percent difference. And at eleven percent difference in some cases, that might be significant. Say, for example, you've got a grade three view and it takes it down to now a two B view. But what that's telling you is that, that that Mac device is actually working as a C around the corner a little bit. Right, so it's it's seen around the corner, and with these Mac Plus uh, blades that are out there that I showed in that previous slide, a lot of them do do that. In other words, there's a significantly improved view on the screen compared to what you see in the mouse. So what that's telling you is that you are seeing around the corner, and when you're using a bougie which is straight out of the package with just a coup de tip, this could be one of the reasons why your bougie goes posterior. Right, is that uh, it's not when you have that mismatch from what you see in the mouth to what you wouldn't see. It's better on the screen. That means it's seeing around the corner, and that you are using now a straight device with a coup de tip, and you might run into problems. Right. So if that's the case, where you have this mismatch, then what you should do is use a stylated endotracheal tube that you're able to manage that without a, a you know an, an, an issue. Or again, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to modify your bougie, assuming that you have a bougie that is modifiable. So we do what's called a pillow bend, where we'll take it out, the bougie, and we'll bend it on the pillow. Um, or again, we do that preemptively, and that gives a bend that will hold. We've got enough memory that will hold. So it will manage that slight anterior um, direction that these um, Mac Plus blades give. When we look at bougies, again, remember the other package is straight. Um, we call the pillow bend, again, a, just a subtle one that will help you manage most of the troubles that you have with the Mac blade. A deliberate bend is something that we can uh, use with a hyperangulated blade and there is a steerable tip one. The other thing that will happen when the bougie goes posterior is whenever it happens, that's happening, look back at the mouth. Right, because if you have restricted mouth opening and bigger teeth, what's happening is that you are going to be pivoting. You're pivoting the uh, bougie on the teeth, and ultimately that will cause another pivot point. You're going to direct it posterior. So whenever you're having problems and it's going posterior, look at what's happening at the mouth. So Macintosh standard a uh, uh, geometry VL, which in the mouth should be uh, uh, we see in the mouth. We assume is what you're going to see on the screen, whereas hyperangulated video laryngoscopy, um, what you see in the screen is very different from the look in, in the mouth. The look in the mouth, you are going to see nothing, right? So hyperangulated video laryngoscopy and bougie use, this is a problem. If people say you can use a bougie with hyperangulated video uh, laryngoscope, people are going to have troubles, especially if you're ta we're talking about picking, opening a bougie up out of a package and using it. It will fail, okay? So the only real way you can use a bougie with a hyperangular video laryngoscope is if you were to do use a deliberate bend, as I showed you before, right? And this is what the way we would do a deliberate bend, and we just hold it there, and with the bougie that we use, this is the way it looks, you know, afterwards. And with that, we're able to manage a hyperangulated video laryngoscope. Now, the steerable bougie, you know, people are, are gaga about this. Remember, what you have to do is you have to bend it down to create that coup de tip, whereas with a regular, um, you know, uh, deliberately uh, bent uh, bougie, you already have your coup de tip. So the only advantage is it allows you to reverse that bend. Um, we'll see what the literature shows. It is kind of cool, but I'm not sure how much additional value it provides. So at the end of the day, folks, it's not about the device. It's about the hands that use it. Um, bougie is in my bougie rant. Uh, it's an adjunct and it's adjunct to optimized laryngoscopy and intubation. If you want more detail on bougie use, I got a part one and part two deeper dive into this. And then uh, Scott Weingart's MCRIT uh, did a, a piece based on, on the stuff I had done on our, our website on Bougie Masterclass. Thanks for your attention. Take care. Bye.